James, and it has been a wonderful blessing so far. And uh, James had some really wonderful insight, didn't he? Amen. It's good to know that the church into the second and third and fourth generations, so to speak, descended from the apostles, uh, still held strong to the foundation truths. And uh, of course, James was a contemporary of the apostles, so it would have been kind of hard. He could have done it. It could have would have been kind of hard for him to veer too far off, uh, but he was part of the Jerusalem Council. He was involved with this thing from the very start, from the very beginning of the Christian faith. He was there, and uh, he certainly had some wonderful insight, some wonderful teaching. And uh, he's my kind of guy, very substantive. And, he, and if you notice, he doesn't really mince a lot of words. He pretty much just says what he needs to say. He does. Paul has a habit of trying to be colorful. Paul had a way of, you know, getting wordy and, you know, kind of being a little uh, blown up with a lot to say. But James uh, was pretty much right to the point. And uh, so I really love and appreciate the book of James. So we're going to continue tonight with our Bible study in the book of James. And uh, if we'll just bow our heads and pray before we start. Father, we thank you, God, for today. And we thank you, Lord, once again for this opportunity to be in the house of God. We're so grateful, Lord, for the country that we live in and the freedoms that we enjoy today. And, Lord, we're grateful that you've allowed us to raise up a church of this nature where we can come, God, and be understood and understand others. Lord, where we can be open and honest about ourselves, where we can be truthful and plain-spoken and not have to hide and duck issues. And Master, tonight we just ask God, as we come into this place, that your anointing and your presence would rest upon every part of this Bible study. Anoint the teacher, anoint the student. God, let everybody that's here in this building, those that are watching on the Internet, let them be blessed, encouraged, helped, and lifted up by this word tonight, help me, Lord, to deliver it as you would have me to deliver it. And help the ears of the hearer to receive that which the Spirit would say unto the church. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Welcome. We're missing some of our folks tonight. We've got folks uh, that recently have had a lot of schedule changes and things. So our Tuesday night isn't as well attended as we'd like it to be. But we welcome you. Amen. So we have been studying the book of James for the last several weeks now. And it has really proven to be a great blessing. James has got an awful lot of good things to say. He's got a lot of uh, spiritual insight. And as I was saying a moment ago, he's a very plain spoken man. He's not one to mince a whole lot of words. Well, tonight we begin at verse number 11. In chapter 4, James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, as they speak to the issue of slander, James writes, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his, judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? If you remember, when we first started our walk through the book of James, uh, we talked about the fact that James was part of the Christian movement from day one. He was there at Pentecost. He was there at the council. Uh, in Jerusalem when the issue of the Gentiles was brought up and, and they were questioning what do we need to tell the Gentiles they, that they must embrace relative to the law, if anything. And it was James who suggested uh, the answer that was formally, finally accepted and ratified and then it was written down as sent to the Gentile churches. We also talked about the fact 
that you can tell that James is probably the first epistle of all the New Testament epistles. It's probably the first written. And you can tell partly by the language that he employs. James is very much still in the Jewish mindset. He's still very much in the Hebrew mindset. And he's looking at the church still very much through Hebrew eyes. You'll notice here he speaks and says, Speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth, judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law. So clearly he is making reference back to the Old Testament Mosaic law. And what James here is probably encountering and what he is responding to, uh, most likely, is the conflict that began very early in the Christian faith as people began to convert and come to Christ and they began to uh, follow the Lord Jesus Christ. All of a sudden you begin to have this conflict. How much of the law need we embrace? If Christ is the fulfillment of the law, then how much of the law do we still need to, to follow? Do we need to follow after the uh, feasts? Do we need to follow after uh, the holidays? Do we need to uh, follow after the rules of dress and, and food and all of these sorts of things? And this conflict began to arise, and Paul also addresses it later in his epistles because it's still very much a raging conflict uh, when Paul is active in his writing. And, uh, but what happens is you begin to have a lot of people who uh, begin to experience their liberty in Christ and they start going in different directions. And one says, I think now I can eat pork. And the other one says, well, I think now I don't have to wear fringes on the bottom of my clothes. And I think I don't have to do this, and I don't believe we have to do that. And then you begin to have conflicts, because you have one over here saying, Oh, no, no, that guy's all wrong. He shouldn't be doing that. Just because you've come to Christ doesn't mean that you don't follow the law. And all of a sudden, all these conflicts relative to the hundreds and hundreds of legalisms within the law of Moses began to arise and this is probably what James is addressing here he's saying all right folks listen you cannot be sitting in judgment of one another it is not your business if you want oh, this is important for the New Testament church this isn't just good for them this is good for us just wait and see where I go with this it says if you're gonna sit and you're going to define points of the law and you're going to determine in your mind which are applicable today and which are not. And then you're going to sit in judgment of those who don't embrace your interpretation of it. He said, then you're no longer one who's following after the law. He said, now you've become a judge. So that's an even higher position. They have lawyers in biblical times. And I, when I say lawyers in the Hebrew uh uh, civilization. It wasn't a lawyer in the sense of law as we know it. It was uh, the law of Moses. It was, they were very well trained in regard to the law of Moses. And so what happens is, uh, James says, you guys are setting yourselves up much further, much higher than merely one who's walking after the law. Because one who walks after the law, listen carefully now, is not concerned with defining the law for others. That's right. Boy, don't we live in a society today, don't we have a right-wing fundamentalist bunch of folks in our world today who seem to think that it is their job to define the law, what is applicable to others and what is not applicable to others, which parts apply and which parts don't apply to everybody else but themselves. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. We've got an entire group of folks in America today that have set themselves up as judges. They're not even those that are attempting to follow the law. No, that's not their job. Their job is to determine which parts of the law apply to you and me. Do you follow what I'm saying? They're not, they're not busy in themselves with trying to obey it themselves. 
Oh no, heaven forbid, God forbid we do that. All they're worrying about is how it applies to everybody around them. And this is exactly what James addresses in chapter 4. He said, and then on top of that, when you begin to judge the law, he said, you become one who speaks, who speaks evil of the law. Now you make out as if the law were a bad thing. Say, so, you know, you've got those who uh, begin to judge and criticize that uh, these aren't doing this. They're not following the dietary laws. You know, the dietary laws are ridiculous. They're unnecessary. They're, they're stupid. Well, no, they serve their purpose. They may not apply today. You may not be subject to them today. But don't make the law of God evil. Hello now. Don't try to make out. There's a lot of people act like I, you know, people write on Facebook all the time. And I've seen people write, you know, well, in the Old Testament, God was just this miserable, hateful, judgmental, vindictive, you know, hideous character. And no, God was not a hideous, hateful, vindictive, mean character. What God was illustrating for humanity is if you want to live by the letter of any law, it is going to be brutal. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. If you're going to live by the letter of any law without mercy, if you're not going to take circumstance into the equation, it is going to be merciless. It is going to be horrible. And God was trying to illustrate to the Jewish people that law without mercy is a terrible burden to be under. But you know what? you got some people, and it's not such a hard burden for them to be under the law, brother. You know why? Because, it, what I've just been saying, because they're so busy trying to figure out how it applies to everybody else that they're never really expending energy trying to live it for themselves. Therefore, it never becomes a great burden to them. If all you do all the time is try to interpret it and translate it and apply it to everybody around you, then you don't feel the weight of it. That's right. You don't feel it. Because you're not applying. That's like people who come to church and they listen to the preacher preach and they sit there. Boy, I sure wish Joel was here to hear this because he sure could use this, boy. And I wish Bob was here to hear that because, boy, Bob could really use it. And, boy, I'll tell you, oh, Joni could really, she, boy, that would slap her right upside the head if she were here to hear that. And they're listening, and everything they hear, they're hearing in terms of how it applies to everybody else. Hello, now. And you know what? That type of person will never feel the prick of conscience. They will never feel what the term we talked about it Sunday morning. They will never feel what we commonly refer to as conviction. And I spoke Sunday and talked about the fact conviction is not from God. Conviction is from our conscience. So they will never feel the prick of conscience because they're never listening and applying what they're hearing to themselves. They're too busy applying it to everybody else. So therefore, those who followed the law with this mentality never felt the weight of the law. It was never heavy on them. This is why the Lord said, you bind up burdens and put it on other people's backs, but what? But you won't carry it yourself. That's right. Isn't that what Jesus said? This is what He's talking about. He said, you're so busy defining it for everybody else, but you're not striving to live it. I love people who spend all their effort and energy coming against gay, lesbian people, and yet they're on their third and fourth marriage. And they don't think a thing in the world about it. Oh, no, 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 they don't think. But if you're going to take the points of law, which is where they're drawing their negativity and their criticism and their condemnation from, it's all being drawn from the law. If you're going to draw that from the law, well then, honey, you better be careful because my Bible tells me that once you embrace one point of the law, you become subject to all of it. Uh -huh. 
There are a lot of the people in the New Testament Christian church today who are going to stand before God in the judgment and be shocked out of their mind when they find out that God closes the New Testament and opens the Old Testament. Uh -huh. Hello now. And says, okay, now we'll continue with judgment. Well, Lord, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, why, why are you changing the books you're using? You changed the book you were using. You're the one who went back to the Old Testament. You're the one who decided that it was so imperative to live up to all of these laws. And the minute you began to do that, grace, what did the Word of God tell us? It's of none effect. He said, therefore, you're no, under, you're no longer under the law of grace. I've got to close up the New Testament because that doesn't apply to you. And we need to go back to the Old Testament. And you will be judged with the Hebrews who never believed in me, who never accepted me, who never received me. Oh, my word. I'm here to tell you, folks, it's going to happen to a lot of Christian people. Because they want to go into that law. They want to pick and choose. What applies to everybody else? And they do not want to step under the full weight of the law and bear up underneath it by applying what it says also to themselves. I love people who talk about, well, there's the moral law and then there's the, the other laws, you know, that deal with diet and deal with clothing and all this. And the, the other laws don't apply. Well, what about the laws... That deal with a woman being a virgin when she marries. What about the other laws that deal with you can give a bill of divorcement, but you never have permission from God? I know I'm a I sound like a real strict teacher, but folks, I believe the word of God. What about the other laws that say, let me tell you a little secret about divorce and remarriage in God's eyes. Let me tell you what the word of God teaches. God gives an individual the ability to get out of a bad marriage. Particularly if the spouse is not being faithful. However, you are never given permission to remarry until that spouse is dead. Divorce is an issue that affects the here and now, but it is not recognized in eternity. That's what Paul taught. I'm not teaching what the Old Testament law taught. I'm telling you what Paul the Apostle taught. He said, when you divorce, you're still married to that person in God's eyes until that person's dead. It, you've been able to separate. You've been able to get out of a bad relationship situation here on earth. But you do not have a license to remarry. How many non-GLBT folks do we know that want to live up to that standard? How many non-GLBT folks we know are able to explain their way around that every which way but upside down. How many, I, you know what I love is when somebody non-GLBT said, well, I repented of my divorce. I said, really, so you separated from your remarriage. No, I didn't separate. Because now that we're married, you know, it's sacred. Uh, sin is sacred? You somehow made something God said you can't do not only did you make it doable, but you made it sacred. Holy Moses. Boy, isn't that a real kiss in the... <laughs> isn't that something how people... But you, you see how people can expend all their energy applying the rules to everybody else and not for one minute get up under the weight of that for themselves. This is what James is talking about in James chapter 4. He said, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? It says, in the end, you may set yourself up as a judge, but you have no power whatsoever to enforce that law. You may think you have power to define it and interpret it, but you have no power to enforce it. So there's only one that's got the power to enforce it. And if that be the case, who in the world are you to set yourself up as a judge? Amen. Well, that's a wonderful... Amen. And you, I mean, you see how plainly he says it? He really doesn't, he doesn't really mince a lot of words with it. He says it very plainly. Two verses, he basically says, shut your mouth and leave others alone. 
Let them work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Let them work out their own relationship with God. Don't you be bothered with their experience. Be bothered with yours. Anybody who's attended our church here for any length of time knows I teach all the time just as plain as I can say it. The only person in this church you need to be concerned with is you. That's right. The only obligation you have to the guy next to you or to the woman next to you, the only obligation you have to them is to encourage them and to hold them up. That's right. Amen. Anything that can be misconstrued as, as discouraging them, anything that could be misconstrued as placing a stumbling block before them is not permissible. Amen. It has no place in Amen. God's church. Amen. If more churches would function in this way, then GLBT people could go to any church in the country. That's right. And they could find inspiration. They could find faith. They could find encouragement. They could find all the wonderful positive things that people glean from a relationship with the house of God. Amen. Amen. But because from the pulpit to the pew, we've got people who want to expend all their energies nitpicking through the law, number one, Trying to determine what applies to this one and that one. And never one minute did they stop and say, does this apply to me? Not for one minute do they even have that thought come across their mind. Because we have people whose focus is on everybody but themselves, the church of Jesus Christ becomes a place where people feel oppressed, where people feel depressed, where people get discouraged. Uh -huh. Isn't that sad, folks? Instead of being able to go into the house of God and be encouraged in your faith, instead of being able to go into the house of God and be inspired, you're walking in and you're literally getting a shopping basket full of the opposite. My Lord, have mercy. Let's move now into verses 13 through 17. The, uh, James now addresses the issue of boasting. In verses 13 through 17 read, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away, vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And boy, wait till we get to that last verse. Mm -hmm. Talk about a powerful statement. Uh -huh. So James says, when he speaks of boasting here, he's not talking about bragging. He's not talking about vanity. That's not what James is talking about. James is talking about when you speak of things as though you know something you cannot possibly know. He said, they say, oh, tomorrow I'm going to go up to Rome and I'm going to live there for a year and I'm going to buy a bunch of stuff and bring it back here and sell it and make a lot of money. You are, are you? How do you know the day after tomorrow you're not going to drop dead of a heart attack? See, one of the things that Christians, as Christians, one of the things that we're supposed to do, we're supposed to live our lives with our full and complete confidence in God. This is why we don't do tarot cards. This is why we don't do uh, uh, fortune tellers. This is why we don't do Ouija boards. This is why we don't, we don't need, I don't need anything or anyone to tell me about tomorrow. God has my tomorrow in his hand. Uh-huh. And my faith and my confidence is in God. But when we talk like we're going to do, we're going to have, we're going to accomplish, 
we're completely ignoring the fact that God is in this equation. So James basically says, he doesn't say, you can't say you're going to do, you hope to do, you want to do, you're, you're, you're planning to do. He said, but acknowledge God willing. He said, keep God in the equation and acknowledge that whatever plans you have, whatever desires you have, whatever goals you have, whatever things you're wanting to do, they are subject to the will of God. Amen. That's why we say, well, God willing, I'm going to go shopping tomorrow. Amen. God willing, I'm going to take a vacation in, in, in uh, August. You, do you follow what I'm saying? All we're doing by simply acknowledging God's will as part of the process. We're keeping God in the equation, top to bottom, front to back, all the way around. We're not speaking as though God is not at the top of our priority list and the will of God. Amen. Now, I've just been preaching the last couple of Sundays on this very type of subject matter, haven't I? And this is what James is talking about. He said, when you start talking about everything you're going to do and everything you're going to accomplish and all this stuff, he said, and you do not acknowledge the will of God in all of this, you're speaking out of turn because you don't know what tomorrow holds. Life is short. I've told Tommy, yes, I, I believe that God has me doing what I'm doing. I believe the Lord's called me to the work that I'm doing. I don't know when He's going to call me home. I don't know when my number will come up. I don't know when the Lord's going to say, all right, Charles, you've done as much as I want you to do. I don't know. So I work in today. I plan for tomorrow. I hope for the future. Hello now. But... I leave it all in God's hands. So God willing, one day this church will be full. Hallelujah to God. God willing, one day we're going to reach a whole bunch of GLBT folks and help to restore their hope Amen. and restore their faith and restore their confidence in a living God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Now, James says to speak without keeping God in the equation is evil. Because you're speaking like an unbeliever. You're talking like somebody who doesn't have God in their life. Somebody that doesn't have God in their life, they think that they're in charge of their tomorrow. They think that they make their own plans and they design their own lives and they organize what direction things go for for themselves. But we as believers know better. That's right. And this is why James said, all James says, look, all he says in verse 15, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will. All he says, he says, I'm not disagreeing with what y'all are saying. But what I'm trying to tell you is, you ought to predicate everything you say with God willing. Or if the Lord will. When you start saying that, otherwise, you're, you're talking out of your hat. When you speak in absolutes and you don't have a clue what tomorrow holds, then you're boasting. You're speaking beyond your ability to control and to function. Now, let's go down to verse 17 because, boy, this is one of the most powerful verses in the entire Word of God. James says something here that is so powerful. He says, To him, therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. This is why I say folks come and they hear our message and they understand it and they see it and it's just as plain as day in front of their face. I had a preacher in New York who used to come to a Bible study I did in New York City when my former partner and I started our work in New York City almost 20 years ago. And this, he was a mainstream Pentecostal preacher and he came to our Bible studies. And one day his wife said to me, Matos 
sees, he understands, he knows what you're saying is true. About Jesus' name, baptism, and all that. She said, but he's afraid to, to, to obey it. He's afraid to do it. He's afraid he's going to have to go back to his church and teach them. She said, and, and he's afraid he'll lose the church. And I said, sister, to him that knoweth to do good, it does it not. To him it is sin. Now somebody that's completely ignorant of it will stand before God in a very different place. Seriously. They're going to stand before God in a very different place. They have no knowledge of it. They have, they have no understanding of it. This man does. Once you have the knowledge of it and an understanding of it, you become responsible for it. All of a sudden, any responsibility that you may not have had prior to this, honey, all of a sudden, the full weight of that responsibility falls on you. Because now you know to do good. And to do anything different than that is sin. What does sin mean? It means simply a violation. You've broken the rules. You've gone against what God... God says, no, as I lead you, what are you supposed to do? Follow. As new revelation comes, as new understanding comes, it's my job to follow, not to buck it, not to fight it, not to push it, but to accept it, to submit to it, and to follow. Amen. And this is what James is speaking of. He says, listen, I'm telling you how to handle this. I'm telling you folks how this ought to be done. Now you know. So now if you don't, you're going to be responsible for it. Because I've told you. Coming to church can be dangerous. <laughs> Seriously, coming to church can be dangerous at a spiritual level because God help you if the preacher is actually preaching the Word of God and if he's actually subjected himself to the leading of the Holy Ghost because whatever he says, you're going to, come, you're going to become responsible for. It. If it's the truth, it's the truth. That's right. Whether you like it or you don't. If it's the truth, it's the truth. If it's what the Lord asks of us, it's what the Lord asks of us. Okay, let's go ahead then and move into chapter 5. Sorry about that. I have it all on separate uh, files. There we go. All right, let's go now into chapter 5. We try to cover as much ground as we can. Last week, we, we only got about two-thirds of the way through chapter 4. Let's see how far we can do. Now, at this election season in the great old U.S. of A., here's an interesting topic that James addresses. <laughs> A warning to rich oppressors. This is verses 1 through 6, chapter 5, actually. It says chapter 4 up there, but it's chapter 5. And James says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back, kept, kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condem condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Wow. In a nutshell, can I tell you in a, in, a, in a simple sentence what James is saying here? He said, all you fat cats who made so much money on the backs of other people, don't you think for one minute that God does not hear their cry. 
that's what he's just said here in a nutshell. He said, you people, you don't have that wealth and that prosperity because you went out there and did all these things. Listen, listen carefully. I love here in the great old U.S. of A., I love how we're told that rich men deserve their wealth because after all, they earned it. They built these companies. They did. That's right, they did. And guess what? If it wasn't for every little tiny worm of a man in that company doing their job and doing it well, he would not have what he has. Hello now. If it were not for the laborers at every level in that company doing the job they do and doing it well, he would not be as wealthy and as prosperous as he is. But isn't it funny how quickly the wealthy forget and they act like they ran out there, Tommy, and did thousands of jobs. They went out there and performed thousands and hundreds of thousands of tasks. You following what I'm saying tonight? And James says, Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. The Lord, the, oh man, there's so much here. James says, you, you, you've got men who go out and hire people so they can reap your fields and then you don't even let the reapers benefit from that which they have reaped. You hold back from them by fraud. Hello now. Said you actually don't even... So you've got people that are working for you and they're harvesting food from the fields and they're not even able to eat. You got people working for you building cars and they can't even afford to own one. You got people working for you building houses and they can't afford to own a house. Hello now. I'll tell you, we got in today's world, we got people that are serving coffee at Starbucks and they can't even afford to drink a coffee at Starbucks. Hello now. James says, no, let me tell you something, folks. God is aware. My Bible tells me that God is on the side of the oppressed. This is why I try to tell GLBT people all the time. I know that the position of many churches over the last many, many centuries and decades leads you to believe that God don't want nothing to do with GLBT people. I've got news for you. He is aware of the oppression. He is aware of the uh, injustices. He is aware of those things which are perpetrated upon GLBT people that uh, are fraudulent and incorrect and born of lies and born of uh, mistellings. Don't you think for one minute that God is not interested in justice for GLBT people? He is. He is. He is on the side of those that are oppressed. And it doesn't matter why you're oppressed, how you're oppressed, God is on your side if you are unfairly and unjustly being treated. Amen. Let's move on now from this to miscellaneous exhortations. Now for the remainder of chapter 5, James offers just a variety of thoughts on several different topics. He begins verses 7 through 11 with a word about patience and suffering. He said, Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. 
Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Wow, again, this is another one. There's so much here. I could probably spend all night just expounding on this alone. James speaks to us here of the need to be patient. Don't be in a hurry. Don't try. I, I've talked about this many times over the last several weeks. Don't try to expedite things beyond God's will and God's timing. Let God be the one that lifts you up. Let God be the one that exalts you. Let the Lord be the one that establishes things because if you let God do it, folks. I, you know, I, I remember preaching in my very first church, and here I was, 18, 19 years old, and I remember preaching, let God do it because it, they, nobody can do it better than He can. That's right. And the problems that we have in our lives all too often are born of the fact that we try to make things happen a whole lot quicker instead of being patient and waiting on the Lord and letting God work out the details. If you let the Lord work out the details, in the end you'll be so much happier. Amen. It will be so much better. The end result will be so much better. By the time James is finished talking about patience and suffering, he brings us to the example of Job. And he said, now look at Job. He said, look at his end. Look at how it wound up for him. Look at how everything culminated for him. By the time he got to the end, he was better off than he was before he started. Yes, there was a lot of pain to go through. Yes, there was a lot of suffering to go through. But he never gave up his faith. He never gave up his confidence in God. He continued to look upward. And when it was all said and done, he was so much better off than even before the trials had begun. Oh, if only we could learn to be patient and let God work out the details. If only we could learn as children of God to be patient and understand God knows what He's doing. I've said many times, I've been in affirming ministry. It will be 20 years next 2013, next year. I have yet to see what I would love to see. I have yet to see the full fruition and realization of my vision and my dream for our ministry. But you know what? I've told Tommy in the last almost 11 years, I've told him many times, I said, maybe I'm not ready yet. Maybe I'm not ready yet. Maybe I'm not ready yet. See, I'm not going to second guess God's wisdom. I have no business trying to tell the Lord, Lord, you're holding back for me when I'm ready now. Oh, really? I got news for you. I've said this in previous Bible. If you were ready now, you'd have it now. But see, we want to force God's hand. We want the Lord to do it in our time, not His. And if He does... Listen to me carefully. If he did suddenly surrender to our will and do it our way, guess what would happen? You would hold it briefly and lose it. Because you would not be in a place yet in your life to retain it, to keep it. You know, I, I always tease about when you're 20, you think you know everything, you know. Boy, when I was 20, I thought I had the world by the tail. I thought I had my faith, you know. I thought... I thought I knew everything there was to know about the Word of God. And then by the time I hit 30, I look back and say, oh boy, did I not know anything. Was I, you know, boy, I can't believe how little I really did know. But brother, I hit 40 and I'm looking back at 30 and I'm saying, I still didn't know anything. Now I'm pushing up on 50 and I'm saying, you know what? <laughs> because the further we get the more we realize how little we knew. That's right. And that's one of the benefits of old age. That's why so many older folks can be more patient and more long-suffering 
and more uh, easygoing. My little great-grandmother, bless her heart, she was up in her 80s. She was 89 when she died. I'll tell you what, that little lady had the patience of Job. It didn't matter what came at her. It didn't matter what happened, what circumstance. It didn't matter, brother, if it was physical pain or if it was financial trouble or what the situation was. That little lady would just say, well, it'll work out. The Lord always works it out. When you've been down the road long enough, when you've lived enough of life and you've seen God do it over and over and over and over and over again, eventually it becomes hard, fast knowledge. That's right. And you don't believe it. I've preached on this before. You no longer believe it. You know it. I don't believe, I'm not sitting here trying to believe God's going to get me through this. I know God's going to get me through. How do I know? Because He's brought me through so many times before. Uh -huh. All I had to do was wait on Him. All I had to do was be patient. All I had to do was stand my ground. And without fail, He brought me through. Hallelujah. So therefore... I'm in a place in my life today where I know. And I'm able to approach circumstances with a whole different attitude and a whole different mindset because I'm no longer trying to believe God. I love when people use that phrase. Growing up in the Pentecostal church, I've heard that phrase a lot. I'm trying to believe God for a healing. Really? <laughs> well, I'll see you at your funeral. Hello now. Honey, if you got to work at it, you're in trouble. Right. When I lay in a hospital back in 2000 and I was on life support for a month and the doctors told my family I'd be gone in 24 hours for 30 days, they told my family I had 24 hours for a whole month. They say he'll lit but he's got maybe a day, maybe a day, maybe a day. And it kept going over and over for a month. got a prayer cloth from Brother Ronnie, Phoenix, Arizona. I got that prayer cloth, and I was so sick. And I looked at it, and I said, all right, Lord, they're believing you for a miracle. I said, then I have, I, I can't believe you for any less. I said, let's get this thing done. I couldn't talk because I was intubated. I had the tube down my throat and all that. I couldn't speak, but in my mind, I said, Lord, let's get it done. That's exactly what my words were. Let's get it done. Because even in that state, as weak as a kitten, 135 pounds, standing at death's door, I still knew, I, listen to me, I didn't say I still believed, I still knew that God was a healer uh -huh. and that God could give me a miracle. I knew it. It was not a belief in my heart or in my head. It was a fact for me. And when I got that prayer cloth, I said, oh, well, now it's done. I got people praying for me, believing God for a miracle for me. They've done obeyed the word of God. The only thing I have to do is receive it. So I literally said to the Lord in my mind, I'll never forget it as long as I, let's get it done. That's my words. And the next day, my recovery began so powerfully and so fast that they took me off the intubation after nearly a month on life support the next day. Folks, I'm here to tell you, if we can learn to be patient, let God do what He's doing. You know why Jesus hadn't come yet? Because not everything's been done that needs to be done. That's right. That's right. This is what James is saying. He said, be patient. The Lord's coming. Don't you kid yourself. The Lord's coming. He didn't make that promise so he could hear his own voice. He's coming. He said, but everything that needs to be done must be done. He said, he's like a husbandman who's waiting for the former and the latter rain. In other words, he's like a farmer who's waiting for the proper season of harvest. Uh -huh. Sure, I could reap early. I've got a big old garden I planted this year in my backyard. Big old garden. Bigger than this church is. About. And uh, yeah, I can go out there and pluck a bunch of fruit off of my plants early. 
but I won't get as much out of them. I won't get what I can get if I'll just be patient and wait. There's a lot of times, brother, I see an eggplant sitting there, and I'm, I love me some eggplant. And I love me some tomatoes. And I love me some yellow squash and all that. And I see them little boogers starting. And I'm just almost ready to yank them when they're not but, you know, three or four or five inches long, you know. And I've got to remind myself, be patient. There may be another rain coming before they're ready for harvest. Be patient. Every night I turn on my water hose and I water my, my entire garden. Another few days of watering. And that little squash will be a much bigger squash. And I'll get much more out of it if I'll just be patient and let it, and let it finish growing. And this is what James tells the church. He tells us we need to be patient even in suffering, even in trouble, because in the end, God is working His perfect plan. Amen. He's working all things for our good, according to the promise of the Word of God. In verse 12, chapter 5, James speaks of oaths. He said, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. People use swearing. Now, I want to clarify, I don't mean here, you know, GD this and blankety blank that. <laughs> but folks will say, I swear I'll pay you back. I swear on my mother's life I'll pay you back. Well, first of all, honey, unless you're prepared to kill your mother, if you don't pay me back, then you're just using empty words. But they use these empty words in an effort to try to make their vow that much more sincere and, and weightier. And James says, try this. Say what you do and do what you say. And don't ever swear by nothing. Don't ever come out with, I, I, I'll, I'd be willing to put this on the line that I'll do this. No, just do what you say. You know, when you establish a reputation as somebody that does what you say and, and uh, you do what you say and you say what you do, that people don't ever question, do they? I know people that trust me. I, I, I've had employers that trusted me, and they would do things for me that they wouldn't do for anybody else in the company. Because if I said I was going to do thus and so, I did exactly what I said I was going to do. If I said I was going to bring, I've worked for car dealerships. And if I had, my boss used to use me a lot to, uh, he'd tell me, he'd say, Charles, go out in the yard, said, I've got a new van out there, and I want you to, he was from the Massachusetts, Hyannisport area. Matter of fact, he literally was uh, neighbors with the Kennedys. Very, very well-to-do man. And he'd say, I've got a van up there, I want you to bring up here for uh, friends of mine, they're buying it from me, and uh, you're going to drive their car back. I said, okay, sir. And, uh, and you know, and, and sometimes they'd give me money, like a down payment or whatever the case might be, and he'd say, now I want you to bring that by the dealership and just put it through the slot or do this or do that or go to the bank and do, you know, whatever he told me to do, if I said, all right, I'll do it, then that's what's going to get done. I don't care if traffic was so bad coming home that I was four hours late and I had to drive right past my house to go to the bank and do this for him. Well, I could just go home and get some sleep and then deposit this in, on my way to work in the morning. Hello now, how many people you know do that, right? They change their plans. They change, they, they've said they're going to do it one way, but then they turn around and they change their plans and they do it a whole different way. And you know what? There's a lot of potential. You God only knows what kind of trouble can happen. For all you know, your house is going to burn down that night and that check's going to get burned up and it never will make it to the bank. You, but my point is, I would do what I said I was going to do 
And I'd actually have my boss say to me, well, Charles, you, you could have gone ahead on home and just done it in the morning since you didn't get home until so late. And I'd say, no, sir, I told you I would deposit it. When I got here, that's what I did. Amen. You follow what I'm saying? Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Folks, I'm going to tell you, the Christian world today is devoid of people that are living this principle. You got people today call themselves Christians and they do not think anything of saying one thing and doing the complete opposite. And there are people in the affirming community who think I'm real old fashioned and I'm real strict. Oh, he's a hard preacher. He's terrible because I preach integrity. I preach living this thing. Uh -huh. We bought pew. We bought these pews and these chairs off of a church in Fort Worth. I told that man I'd send him a check on certain days of the month. And I'd go out of my way to make sure that I send him those checks. Because you know what? When it's all said and done, I want him to be able to look back and say, you know what? Those GLBT folks over there, for all the criticism they get, for all the judgment people heap on them, for all the negativity that people throw at them, that man said something and he did exactly what he said and he said exactly what he did. Because I guarantee you, there are mainstream, quote, straight folk out there who make the same promises to him who wind up flaking out on him. How much more important is it for us today in our movement, folks, to be people of integrity? How much more important is it for us in this movement? If we will live this thing, uh, you know, we've talked about how the Samaritans were in the New Testament era. And the Samaritans were rejects. The Jews didn't want anything to do with them. The Gentiles didn't want anything to do with them. They were a mixed race. They didn't fit in with anybody. Nobody wanted them. On either side of the cultural lines. And yet, the Samaritans said, Well, the Jews don't want us to come to Jerusalem and worship. But you know what? We'll build a temple of our own. And we'll live this thing better than they live it. And the Samaritans literally strove to live the law of Moses better than their Jewish counterparts did. So they didn't just say, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll look as much like them as we can, but, you know. Well, we'll take the easy way out. No, sir. They had the right mentality. Said, you won't even let us be part of the mainstream church, so to speak. But what we're going to do is we're going to show you what the mainstream church ought to look like. That's what my goal is for GLBT Affirming Ministry. We ought to be showing the mainstream what the church should look like. Amen. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Lest you fall into condemnation. That does not necessarily mean condemnation of God. Doesn't necessarily mean God will condemn you. You're not going to go to hell because you didn't say what you did and do what you say. But boy, I'll tell you one thing. Your testimony go down the toilet. You're going to have all kinds of people around you saying, yeah, he calls himself a Christian, but he'll tell you this and then turn around and do that. Hello now. I got news for you. If anybody knows how a Christian ought to be, it's a non-Christian. That's right. If there's anybody who looks for God's people to live right and act right, it's those that aren't God's people. They know what to look for. And if we're not living it, they know it. And, and this is where James said, lest ye fall into condemnation. Now let's move forward. We're almost done tonight, not too much further. This is a wonderful portion of Scripture that we as Spirit-filled Pentecostal folks have fallen back on since the beginning of this movement James says is any among you afflicted let him pray is any merry let him sing psalms is any sick among you let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. 
Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. James says there's a natural response to situations in our life. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Well, the natural response in human beings is, is any afflicted, let them crab, let them complain, let them gripe. Hello now. That's our natural inclination. Let's start groaning and moaning. And James said, no, 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 no. Is any afflicted among you, let him pray. Turn to God. Don't turn to God last. Turn to God first. Let that be your initial response. Let that be your first response, not your, not your second or third. Talked about it before, back in July of last year. It's been a year ago now, hasn't it? July 4th weekend, went swimming and whatever. We had a little outing with some church folks and had a good time. I woke up July 5th, stone deaf in my left ear. I thought maybe it was water, you know, had gotten into my ear and all that. And uh, But I mean stone deaf. I went and bought some stuff that was supposed to help remove water from your ear and all that, put it in there. Nothing was working. And I mean, I could not hear a thing. You, I could shut the car door when I'd get in to drive. I couldn't even hear that door shut on, out of my left ear. The loudest noise you could make, I could not hear a thing. It, it was stone solid death. What did I do? I called Jack. I said, let's go visit. Bethel Lighthouse, Bethany Lighthouse. Let's go to church that we occasionally fellowship with. I said, Let, let's go visit them. I said, I need prayer. My first response. This wasn't my second or third. I didn't go to the doctor first. I went to the church first. Hallelujah. The next morning I woke up, and I told Tommy when we got out of the, out of the church and went to the car, I said, I actually could hear the door close. It had to be a loud noise, but I could actually hear something that I couldn't hear before. But I was not healed. I still was stone, virtually stone deaf in my left ear. You could talk at me just as loud as you please. I could not hear a thing. Not a thing. And it was driving me insane. Finally, I went to an ear specialist. Some people said, well, you got prayed for. If you got prayed for, why'd you go to an ear specialist? Because I learned a long time ago, sometimes God likes to give you a miracle that you can define. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Sometimes God will give you a miracle, but He wants you to be able to tell folks, I had cancer. Uh -huh. If He heals you just from because you're feeling the symptoms, then you don't ever know what God healed you of. Right. Do you follow what I'm saying? You don't know what kind of a miracle God really gave you. So sometimes the Lord likes to define things so we know what we're talking about and we have a testimony. So I went to the ear doctor and he said, well, he said, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, it's not water. You don't have any water in there. You don't have wax in there. He said, it's very clean. He said, apparently you keep your ears very good as I do. I you know, always use Q-tips and all that after every shower and all this stuff. And he said, well, what happens is there is a virus that is latent in every human body. He said, and on occasion, it somehow becomes activated in certain people. He said, and that virus will attach itself to that nerve in your ear. And he said, and it causes such immediate damage that you will be deaf for the rest of your life in your left ear. He said, honestly... My prediction is that you will never hear again in your left ear. And I was so broken hearted at hearing that. I thought, Lord have mercy. I, and I, what not I booby? Oh, I was upset. And I went home and I said, Lord, I can't be deaf in my left ear. Because boy, it made it hard for me to preach. It, you know, it, 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 when you're accustomed to hearing, you know, and, and I like to sing. I didn't say I sang good, but I like to sing. And I couldn't hear, you know, the music, remember? I went through a few months, and it was really hard. 
And I said, Lord, I can't do this. And the doctor said, I've got a treatment where we can put an injection through your eardrum and we can put some uh, steroids in there. He said, but I'm going to be honest with you. He said, I expect zero result from doing that. He said, but we can do it just so we can say we tried everything. So, okay. So we did it. I had to go back every, I think it was every two weeks for six weeks, uh, for three different shots. And it hurt like you would not believe. They stick a needle through your eardrum, honey, that hurts. And then he pushes that steroid in there and you feel the pressure you know and I've got to lay on my side and let it sit there for about 30 minutes and I was in pain and tears streaming down my face and hurt I'm going through all this painful treatment and there's no improvement there's no improvement and I kept telling Tommy I said I know God's going to heal me didn't I? So I know the Lord's going to heal me I said I know he is so I don't know when I don't know how but I know he's going to do it he said he would so I know he's going to do it. All of a sudden, I begin to hear some things. And I said, wait a minute. I said, you know what? <laughs> My hearing's improving. I can actually hear some stuff. And I noticed gradually that I'm hearing more and more and more. Hmm. Go back to the doctor, the ear specialist up here at Dallas Ear Institute does some tests, calls me up. I've still got the message on my phone, but my phone's in the office being charged right now. He said, you're at 97% in your left ear. This is somebody who was supposed to be deaf the rest of his life in his left ear. I wasn't at 40%. I wasn't at 70%. I wasn't at 80% or 85%. 97%! He said, the only thing I can tell you is, it's a miracle. He said, I've never seen anything like it. He said, I honestly did not expect this in the least. He was prepared to fit me for a hearing aid to try to help me get some kind of hearing back in my left ear. Oh, folks, I'm going to tell you, God's Word is true. God's Word is true. Is there any sick among you? Let them pray. Go to God first. Let the Lord be your first response. But then as I tell people all the time, and I wish people would get this in their head, God does not always heal everything instantaneously. That's right. And there's a reason for that. And if your faith can only last you until right after the preacher takes his hands off of you, then you've got a problem with your faith. See, my faith said God is going to heal me even months later when my hearing was still zero. You follow? Sometimes we are, our faith is tried and it's tested. And I talk about how when we work out, we're using uh, weights, you know, and as we bring those weights down and we push them back up again, that we're experiencing what they refer to as resistance and sometimes God is trying to bring our faith to a new level he's trying to bring our faith to a new place and the only way it can get there is if we have to experience some resistance and we have to push against that resistance and we have to keep believing and we have to keep trusting and we have to keep believing and we have to keep trusting in spite of the circumstance appearing not to get any better but if you can keep believing, God will do it. God will do it. Don't you question for a moment. God will do it. He said, is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. I've been preaching this now for literally just about, about 30 years. He says, is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church. If I go to your house and you tell me how sick you are and how terrible you feel and all, I'm going to say, really? Oh, I'm so sorry. Bless your heart. 
what you don't expect to hear from me. Listen carefully. I, I told you, I'm old time Pentecost. I grew up the old school, okay? I take God's word. I don't believe God says anything just to hear his own voice. What you won't hear from me is, well, brother, would you like me to pray for you? I don't ask. You know why I don't ask? Because that's not what it says. It says, is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders. In other words, let him do the asking. Why? Because in doing so, you're exercising faith. If I wait and keep my mouth shut and wait for you to say, brother, would you anoint me with all the pray? I'm giving you an opportunity to exercise that little bit of faith. That's, right. That's the proper order. That's what God has ordained how it ought to be done. Let them first exercise faith in asking for prayer. You ever wonder why? I don't know how many of you come from Pentecostal background like I do. I've seen more prayer lines and more uh, preachers calling people down. They all, come on down if you're sick, if you need prayer, come on down and we'll anoint you with all the pray. And I've seen more people go home still sick and stay sick. Seen people die that have been prayed for. Hello now. Why? Because we're not doing it the way God ordained it to be done. We're not letting them exercise faith first. I've said this so many times. God always responds. The Lord never takes a proactive position. Faith requires that we take the proactive position. I remember preaching a message many, 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 many years ago. And I talked about how with chess, you know, you got black pieces and white pieces and you hold a piece in each of your hands and the opponent picks one of your hands and whoever gets what color piece starts the game? White. Why? Because white plays first every time. When it comes to faith, it's your move first every time. God doesn't move first. No. Where would faith be? It requires that we move first. This is God's prescribing how we, when we're sick, make the first move. It's by asking for prayer. It's that easy. And just that little tiny step is all the faith we need to receive from heaven a great miracle. That's, right. That's all we need. God said, this is all I'm asking you to do. Ask for prayer. That's all I want you to do. Just ask for prayer. And that is enough faith right there that I can give you what you need. I can heal your body. I can deliver you. I can set you free. Hallelujah. Then the elders of the church will anoint it with all in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Oh, my word. Oh, I know. It's too many. I've just come across way too hard for too many people. I grew up old time Pentecost. I can't help it. Folks, I got news for you. Don't think everybody that prays prays the prayer of faith. Don't think everybody that prays prays the prayer of faith. I know people. I know people that when I go to that person and I ask them for prayer, they're going to pray the prayer of faith. I know... I know they got it in the money. I know it's there. I remember one time I was having a terrible, I was just a teenager, I was about 17, I guess, and I was having a terrible, terrible, terrible toothache with a wisdom tooth. And oh man, it hurt so bad I couldn't stand it. Oh, it was hurting so bad. And I went to Brother Hill, a little UPC brother in Milford, Connecticut. I love Brother Hill. He was a fireball. I said, Brother Hill, would you anoint me with oil and pray for me? I said, this wisdom tooth hurts so bad I can't stand it. He said, certainly. Boy, pulled out his wall, anointed me with oil, laid his hands on me, prayed for me, and I kid you not, I'm not joking. That man, the minute he was done praying, that pain was gone. I mean, literally, the minute he finished, he said, amen, it was done. 
I never experienced anything so fast. It, that was an instantaneous thing. I never experienced anything quite like that before. But you see, I knew Brother Hill was a man of faith. That wasn't somebody who prayed just to be talking. He believed what he said. The problem we have, Christian people run around looking and asking for prayer, and they get somebody to pray for them, and the person they're asking to pray for them hadn't got enough faith to believe God for nothing. Sad but true. Before I left Connecticut as a teenager, my little cousin contracted cancer behind his eyeball and the doctor said they were going to have to take out his entire eye take out the skin the whole socket the eye the nerve behind it i mean it was a big thing i was directing our children's church from the time i was 12 till i was 16 i was the director of our children's church and the church i grew up in the Pentecostal church I grew up up home. And one day, I felt led. I felt inspired by God. I said, we're going to anoint this boy with oil. He was only five. I said, we're going to anoint this boy with oil, and we're going to pray for him, and God's going to heal him. We prayed. We anointed him with oil, laid hands on him, prayed for him. And you know what? <laughs> God healed him all right. They went to bring him in for his exploratory, you know, where they could establish where the tumor was exactly and do all that, you know. And when they went through all their tests, they couldn't find that tumor. Nowhere, no way, no how. I was just a kid. But I believe the Word of God. I had a friend at Riverside Church of God that I loved dearly, Brother Freeman Sensible. He was like an adopted dad to me. I loved that man so much. When I first came back to Texas, uh, back in, oh heavens, after I pastored my first church, so around 85 or so, when I came back to Texas, I heard he was in the hospital and he was in desperate condition, very bad condition. He was dying. And Brother Gillum had already retired, Riverside and all. And I wanted to go see him so bad. Because I love that man. I'm going to tell you if, you, if you ever want to see a miracle, you pray for somebody you really love and care about. Because the key to many a miracle is compassion. That's right. And when you really love somebody and you really care about somebody, I'm going to tell you, you'll touch God for them. That's right. And I wanted so badly to go see him. And uh, at that time, I didn't have a car yet. I didn't have a way. Well, to make a long story short, I never did get to the hospital. He passed away. And to this day, you can think me as vain as you want to. To this day, I believe if I could have gotten to the hospital, he'd have lived. I, to this day, I believe that. I absolutely believe that. And it breaks my heart because I wanted so badly to get there, but I could not get there. And uh, my grandfather, bless his heart, helped, he, before he passed away, he would tell us stories over and over and over again about the many times that God touched him and healed his body. He'd tell you about some of the men in the church. Brother Tatlock and Brothers King. We had two men in our church whose last names were King, the King brothers. Harold and Richard. And my grandfather said, when I lay in a hospital dying, my gallbladder had exploded and I'd gone toxic. And he said, and those two men came into that room they anointed me with oil and they laid hands on me and prayed for me. He said, I felt like somebody put an electric wire against my body. He said, I could feel the power of God surge through me and God healed me instantaneously. He lived to be 79 years old and that happened to him before he hit 40. God does it. He does it good. Folks, I'm here to tell you what we read in James 5 works. It works. God honors His Word, but it has to be what it says. There has to be a prayer of faith prayed. Don't just, don't just ask anybody to pray. Ask somebody you know believes God. Ask somebody you know has faith in their life and in their heart. Amen. 
He goes on to say, and if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Oh, I wish I had time. I don't. I'm going to end within the next five minutes. I wish I had time to go into this tonight. Maybe next week I'll expound more on this. Healing and forgiveness are united. They're joined to one another. If you look at the ministry of Jesus, the Lord said to the man that was lowered down in front of him, he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. And they said, who's this guy that forgives sins? He said, what, is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or rise and be healed? Which one? Which one do you want? Take your pick. God heals, He saves. When God saves, He heals. When God heals the body, He forgives sin. The Word of God tells us in Isaiah, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. This is all part of Calvary's contract. Hallelujah. This is all part of what God did for us at the cross. He said, if he have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Can you imagine? Because when God does one transaction, he also does the other. Forgiveness and healing are joined one to another. Praise God. And I could, I could go into a real long teaching on that. One of these days I will, because uh, there's some wonderful stuff in there that I'd love to go into. Then he said, confess your faults one unto another. Pray for one another that ye may be healed. I remember preaching one time in a church. And the title of my, of my message was, Don't You Dare. I said, the word of God says this, but don't you dare do it. Because in most churches you go into, don't you dare confess your faults one to another. Oh, honey, you'll have people talking about you. You'll be... You'll be branded. You'll, you know what I'm saying? You'll have the gossip mills going. I said, don't you dare do it. But this is what we ought to be able to do. The Word of God says, Paul the Apostle said in Corinthians, when we come to the Lord's table for communion, and we've got issues in our life that we have not addressed, he said, there are times people come and they partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily. He said, and for this cause, many are sick and even some sleep. He said, there are sick among you. There are people who, are, who died. Because they come to the Lord's table. They come to communion. And they're very haphazard and careless about referencing what these elements represent. And what James is saying here in chapter 5 really kind of goes with what Paul says about the Lord's Supper. He said, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. He's saying, listen, this is how we're able to clear ourselves up and get everything cleaned up and get it where it ought to be. So when we go to the Lord's table, we're not in a bad place. He said, you got people that are sick among you. Hello, confess your faults one unto another. What is the next line? What does it say? That ye may be forgiven? No. That ye may be healed. What's the issue? You, you've, been, you've been at the Lord's table and you probably shouldn't have. What's the issue that's holding you back? What's that thing in your life that has brought this sickness on? What's this issue in your life that's brought this into your life? Let's talk about it so you can be healed. You ought to be able to get up in church and say, I have a terrible habit of cussing. There are times I get aggravated. I just let my big mouth fly and bless God, there I go. You ought to be able to do that. You ought to be able to get up and say, I have a problem, you know, I, I sometimes my old lust mechanism gets the best of me. Hello now. You ought to be able to say that. Don't you dare in most churches. But you ought to be able to say it in the midst of God's people. Because remember what we were saying earlier about judgment? Everybody in the church, nobody looking at you if they're looking at you properly except to encourage you and help you and inspire you and uplift you. 
So if you tell me you've got a weakness, you've got a fault, you've got an area in your life that if the devil shakes it hard enough, it's going to give way, then all I'm going to try to do is strengthen you in that area and encourage you and help you every which way I can. Because that's my job. That's what God's called me to do. Amen. All right. I'm going to stop there this evening.